Hello from Montreal. Uh, my name is Roland de Vries, as I may already have been introduced. I'm the principal of the Presbyterian College, having been appointed to that position just this past fall by the Board of Governors. It's as principal of the college and on behalf of our community that I want to extend greetings to you. We are together in communities of faith and worship and study, and uh, we are living this particular life in, in challenging times. And so our prayer, uh, both for myself and the, the community of the college, is that you would know the grace and the peace of Christ in these particularly challenging uh, semesters. I'm grateful to Professor Irwin for this invitation uh, to share God's word with you, and we're going to be looking at uh, the narrative of the presentation. Before we do that, and before we come to that, I thought I would take an opportunity to share something of the college with you, but rather than doing so through my own speaking, I thought I would share this brief video with you. It introduces you to some of the students of this particular community and to our life uh, here at this college. And so following this video, I'll have an opportunity to share about this uh, beautiful story of the uh, presentation of Jesus in the temple. So first, the video. <music> Usually when God calls us, he doesn't call us to work alone. It's a real strength of this college that we have people from all over the world. Being in a community of believers. But we still worship this one God together in different ways. I graduated from the college uh, almost 20 years ago, and at that time and up until today, a community life has been at the heart of who we are. And it's really beautiful to see. Understanding how other denominations understand and worship God is also a blessing and a source of strength. And we can only learn from one another. We can only grow in our own faith as we engage meaningfully with one another. Learning about the history of all the different thinkers throughout the ages. And recognizing how rich the discussion has been for literally thousands of years. From philosophers to theologians. And then realizing that I'm just one of them. Studying theology, studying the Bible is all about being surprised. It's about discovering new things, things you hadn't expected, things you hadn't anticipated. Studying in one of the most accredited institutions in the world. The resources that McGill as a university has, um, the history that it has, the professors that it's able to bring. I guess I wasn't thinking McGill was quite as secular as it is. And that's an interesting context in which to study. It forces you to think about who you are, to think about your faith, and to begin to articulate it. Throughout my studies, my faith has been stretched and strengthened in a lot of ways. And to be able to apply um, 1 Peter 3.15, to be ready to give a defense for the hope that I believe in. It's forced me to think about them more deeply than I would have otherwise. I hope to be able to bring a unity in the places that I work. I feel that God has given me the gift to be able to dialogue and to enjoy dialoguing with um, those with differing viewpoints. Every minister of the gospel desires to make a difference in the world bringing together people who, who otherwise may not speak to each other, who are hurting, who are broken, and, and showing God's love through that. Because actually that was why Jesus Christ came, to make that difference. I've just really enjoyed seeing the vastness of just the study of God in itself and how I'm now included in it. I desire and I wish and I pray that through my preaching, lives will be changed because the gospel is out to change lives. The Lord be with you. We come from our scattered lives to this sanctuary to seek our unity in the Spirit. We come with our concern for the present time and uncertain about the future to seek the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We come uncertain about the future, yet certain about God who holds the future and holds our lives together, and that gives us much joy and hope. Therefore, we join with God's people of every place and every age, with the whole creation, in worship of Almighty God. God's people have gathered, 
Let us worship God. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is no one like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My With my whole being, body, and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow builds her nest, and raises her young at a place near your altar. O Lord of heaven's armies, my King and my God, what joy for those who can live in your house always singing your praises. What joy 
For those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. They will continue to grow stronger and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. O Lord God of heaven's armies, hear my prayer. Listen, O God of Jacob. O God, look with favor upon the king, our shield. Show favor to the one you have anointed. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. O Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. Today's scripture is taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn man shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offer the sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of puddle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. The Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and the sword will pierce your own soul too. There was a prophet Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At the moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. There is alertness in this man's body as he walks across the courtyard. There is a purpose in his steps as he walks across the temple. It's as if he is looking for something, it's as if he's looking for someone, and his pace and his posture suggest someone who is confident that he will find what he's looking for. Anyone who has spent much time in the temple will know who he is, and if you don't know who he is, you will quickly hear about him. He has a reputation. Simeon is usually described using words that we would not use lightly. He is described 
first of all, as a righteous man. What does it mean that he is righteous? Well, if we conceive of his righteousness expansively, it means that he faithfully keeps Torah, he obeys the law of God, he is someone who speaks honestly, he is someone who gives generously, he wouldn't slander anyone behind their back, he treats friend and stranger with respect and with grace. In fact, similar language is used in chapter 1, verse 6, to describe Elizabeth and Zechariah. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Simeon, similarly, is a righteous man. Let me ask a question. Do we believe that such a person is possible? Can there be such a thing as a righteous person? A person of fundamental integrity and generosity and compassion and love, a keeper and a lover of God's law. Our culture is in many ways characterized by deep cynicism. To use Recur's phrase, the school of suspicion has taught us that there is always something below the surface, some hidden agenda, some suspect motive, some form of self-interest. We are often or always privileging ourselves. This suspicion and cynicism runs deep in contemporary culture, too deep, perhaps. Of course, even the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans says that no one is righteous, not one. He's quoting one of the Psalms, of course. The scriptures of the Old Testament and the New Testament are not naive about the possibility of sin in our lives. The biblical writers know very well our propensity to promote ourselves, to deceive ourselves, to manufacture idols, to serve our own interests. Yet, the scriptures somehow display this honesty about human brokenness and sin without ever descending into cynicism, without descending into that fundamental lack of trust in the human Indeed, the scripture writers display a remarkable confidence in the transformation that can happen when women and men walk with God, when a community of God's people walks with God, when a family walks with God. When we walk with God or when God walks with us, it is possible that goodness and faithfulness and righteousness might become real in our lives and in our relationships. As an aside, perhaps, it's hard for me to imagine that there could be any other antidote to modern cynicism than the antidote of faith. If there is to be any relief from the deep cynicism of late modern culture, I suspect that relief will only come from a trust in the God of covenant and creation, the God who in Jesus Christ transforms lives, and leads us in the way of goodness and truth. In any case, Simon is a righteous man. Well, if our culture is cynical about the possibility of a righteous person, imagine the response when Simeon is next described as a devout person. In our culture, we are impressed by competent people, we are impressed by successful people. We are impressed by intelligent people. We are impressed by beautiful people. We are impressed by activists who get things done. But a devout person? A deeply prayerful person? Devotion to God and the devotion within the Christian tradition today are not considered standout qualities for our culture. But that's just how Simeon is described in Luke's Gospel. He is devout, someone who deep prays to God deeply and honestly, someone who worships God faithfully, someone who offers sacrifices meaningfully, someone who shares in religious festivals regularly, someone who is open to and moved by the Holy Spirit. So Simeon is described as a person who is faithful to the law of God. He is a righteous person. And he is described as faithful in the worship of God. He is a devout person. And it is just this man that we see walking across the courtyard. 
alert in his body. It is this Simeon who walks with purpose through the temple as if he's looking for something, as if he's looking for someone. His pace and his posture speak of his confidence that he will find what he is looking for. Simeon has always believed that this day would arrive, has always had a deep sense that God was going to show him something amazing, that with his own eyes he would see the one through whom God would put the world to rights. That with his own eyes, he would see the one through whom God would do everything implied in the word save. The one through whom God would save and help and forgive and set free and embrace and give a future and make human lives beautiful and righteous. It was the Holy Spirit that had prodded him. Go to the temple, Simeon. Keep your eyes open. God has spoken to him in heart and mind. Go to the temple, Simeon. Your faith will be honored. This is the day that you have been waiting for. Did Simeon know exactly what he was looking for? What he saw, of course, was a family, a father and a mother, a child, perhaps surrounded by other extended family and friends, Mary and Joseph, are at the temple to fulfill the requirements of the law, to bring an offering of thanks and praise. They've come to present their firstborn son and their offering of pigeons as an expression of worship and service to the God of the Hebrew people. They have come to say, this is your child, O God, and we are your children. Together with your people, we worship you. The Gospel writer Luke wants us to see that this child is raised within the covenant traditions of the Hebrew people. He wants us to see that he is a Jewish child, rooted in the faith and traditions of the Jewish people. This Jesus is one who it relates to and who reveals the God of Israel. So that you cannot understand this child without understanding the family and people into which he is born. You cannot draw near to this child without also drawing near to wrestle with the God of Jacob. You cannot know this child without knowing the story of this people's wilderness wanderings or their exile. You can't understand or know this child if you haven't heard God's ancient promise to his people that they will one day come home. Equally, however, it seems to me that the Gospel writer wants us to see that the context into which Jesus is received is particularly a community of righteousness and devotion, of Holy Spirit openness. This is represented, of course, in that beautiful cast of characters, including Elizabeth and Zechariah and Mary and Joseph and Anna, and of course, Simeon. Righteous, devout, exhibiting Holy Spirit openness. What are we to make of this? It seems to me that there are two ways we can read this characterization of Simeon and those who received Jesus. The first way of reading this narrative is more difficult than the second, but both represent a kind of challenge to us as those who belong to communities naming and following Jesus as Lord. The first way to read this is to say that in order to welcome Jesus as Messiah, in order to even recognize this one who is Lord and Savior, we must be communities of righteousness and devotion and Holy Spirit openness. This is perhaps the path of costly discipleship, where our reception and our perception of Jesus requires us to be a certain kind of people, a people dedicated to the path of truth and goodness and righteousness, a community committed to the practices of prayerful and scriptural devotion, a community committed to listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The flip side of this, of course, expressing its challenge, is that in the absence of such righteousness and devotion and Holy Spirit openness, we will neither see him nor receive him. Costly discipleship, indeed. 
Now, if we want to cut ourselves a little bit of slack, perhaps the word grace applies here, we might read this slightly differently. We might rather say that as we begin to see Jesus, and as we begin to receive him, we will inevitably find ourselves on the way to becoming communities of righteousness and devotion and Holy Spirit openness. This approach still requires that we see a correspondence between our seeing and receiving Jesus on the one hand, and our being a particular kind of community on the other hand. But it does suggest that we might become such a community as we walk together with him, rather than needing to be such a community in order to see and receive him. Today, I don't intend to suggest one reading over the other, because I think it is precisely a question that the text is posing to us. A question we are left to wrestle with. We must be such a community to see and receive Jesus? Or, as we see and receive him, we will become such a community. Of course, the presentation of Jesus is a celebration of Jesus. Here he is. Yet it is a celebration that poses a question we should not be too quick to answer. We should not let ourselves off the hook too quickly, as we might be inclined to do. The good news is that whichever answer we choose, there is a shared conclusion. Seeing and receiving this Jesus always corresponds to the way of righteousness, devotion, and Holy Spirit openness. Thanks be to God for this good news. Amen. As you go into the remainder of this day, as you return to your studies, your research, your writing, as you go to live as a follower of Christ among his people, I pray that you will know the blessing of God. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.